I'm delighted to be with you all under these um, difficult conditions for everyone, and I hope everybody's being able to be safe and well. And uh, I'm happy to be talking with you. And I noticed, that, Carol, 1902, that when you were founded, is when Elizabeth Cady Stanton died. I'm always thinking dates, and so that was sort of an interesting uh, connection. And I started taking these road trips, not virtual, but actual road trips, more than 30 years ago. And what prompted me was when I sort of had this epiphany that grew out of my involvement uh, in the women's movement and other movements of social reform and my consciousness just dramatically shifted. And I said, wait a minute, I've spent years studying history. Uh, actually, my kids had been studying history. Uh, and this, of course, has continued even with the grandchildren. Where are the women? And they weren't in any of the books I read. They weren't uh, in bookstores. They weren't in the popular culture. There weren't movies. I mean, there, it was like, where are the women? Especially since women have been an essential part, which I knew from my lived experience of, of building cultures and civilizations and businesses and every aspect of life is dependent on the energy and brilliance and commitment and all the other things that women bring. So with that epiphany, I said, I wonder if women have been in, as invisible in public spaces. Have, have, are they, is this invisibility just totally across the board? And probably my decision to go out and search for um, recognition, any kind of recognition for women, probably stemmed back many, many years ago when I was in my early teens and we were living in Warren, Pennsylvania. My father actually was a psychiatrist on the grounds of the state hospital. My mother was a well-known artist. And one day my mother showed up at school. I'd just gotten out of school and she said, come on, Penn, let's go, which was how my mother did things. And put me in the car and we drove, um, what, six or seven hours to Amherst, Massachusetts. And why did we go to Amherst, Massachusetts? My mother had just discovered Emily Dickinson's poetry long before Emily Dickinson had become a popular icon. And she had this impulse to go find her grave. And it was a, a I don't have a whole lot of childhood memories, but that's one. So I think I sort of put those things together and off I went. And tonight what I'm going to do is we're going to jump around, we're going to go to different places that have to do with Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And I'm also along the way going to be making um, connections to the upcoming, very exciting centennial of the adoption, the addition of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which as you all know, uh, is August 26. Uh, so um, if you're not able to celebrate uh, in 1920, when the uh, uh, celebration happened, uh, many people on the Saturday after uh, Secretary of State Colby had signed and made the, uh, the 19th Amendment official, there were bell ringing all over America. Uh, fire trucks rang bells and churches, uh, although there were a couple of places where the aunties rang bells in mourning. So rather than the celebratory bangs, they were the mourning bangs. But, you know, anti, uh, you know, opposition to good things continue to this day. So we're going to start in Johnstown, Johnstown, New York. And when you drive into Johnstown, and I've been there a number of times over the years, one of the things you'll see, depending on which way you enter Johnstown, is this mural. It's painted on the waterworks. And though, and that's been there probably about 25 years. And it's sort of a strange thing to sort of come around and there's this great big sort of industrial looking building and this wonderful mural. That of course is Rose Cox on the right of the famous um, gelatin, which, uh, and of course the founder, Sir William Johnston. And there's our Elizabeth uh, right, right there as you drive into Johnstown. Uh, this is an interesting marker. It's actually on a building in downtown Johnstown. And you can see at the bottom that it was first dedicated in 1937. One of the things I'm interested in is I'm sort of interested in who has done the dedication and when did they do it? 
I'm just was sort of curious to see when did memorialization for a particular woman begin to emerge. And then you can see it was rededicated in 1975, which shows again that this, there's an energy in Johnstown around commemorating Elizabeth. She's not unknown there. Um, this was actually a, another marker that sort of near the same place in, down, in, in the main street of Johnstown. And uh, this is uh, something that Pataki, when he was governor, put a lot of money into putting, you'll see a number of these as you go through New York State, honoring uh, pioneers. Um, this is a new uh, monument that was just dedicated in 2017 that William Pomeroy Foundation is dedicating a lot of money to putting up markers to suffrage, suffragists at, uh, across the country. I think it's 250. This is important because Elizabeth Cady Stanton was very much influenced by her exposure to her father's law practice. His law practice, of course, was out of his house. The house was near the courthouse. And she, the, you know, in my book, I talk about the stories of, of, of Elizabeth as a little girl, uh, listening to women coming to talk to their, her father to try to get legal advice because of a drunken, abusive husband, a husband who had squandered all their money. And so women would come with these heartbreaking stories and the father couldn't do anything because of the law. And there's the famous story of Elizabeth vowing that she was going to take a pair of scissors and cut those laws out of the book. And I guess this, as the story goes, um, what the maid heard her, knew about her plan and alerted her father and her father talked to her and said, that's not gonna change anything. You're gonna to need to grow up and change the law. But she was very much influenced. She had a lot of conversations with law students who would taunt her about what she couldn't do because she was a woman. So this actually is a very apt monument to have put this marker up to celebrate that part. Uh, this marker is, and this was dedicated in 1969, 89. And this, this raises interesting questions about memorialization. And some of these I know are going to be hard to read. And if you, ever, if anybody wants the full text of a marker, just send me an email through my website and I'll give you that address later. And I'll send you all the text on all of this. But the line, if you count, if you look underneath where it says her name, that's a lot of hyperbole, the greatest feminist reformer of the 19th century America. And this is one of the really interesting things, I think, about memorialization. You, if you sort of get into this and start looking and reading historical markers and signs, if you're the kind of person when you're driving, you see one and you stop and you read it, there, there are a lot of things sort of to look for that I do. First of all, the artistry, you know, how, how, what is the design of it? Is it readable? Accuracy is a big one. Is it accurate? Um, and then also to look for things like, you know, um, the purpose of it. Clearly, th this is the purpose. This was written by people who very much had a, 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 a very vaulted sense of Elizabeth Cady Sand. And it's not necessarily, um, a credit, I'm not necessarily criticizing that since this is her hometown, but it's an interesting thing when you're thinking about landmarks as educational devices, when you're thinking about the purpose of a landmark and what is the impact on people who stop and read it or, 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 want, or learn from it. Um, if people even do stop and look, you know, I, I certainly do see people stopping and looking, probably not as often as I do, but it's all of these are really kind of provocative questions, especially for um, those of you who are involved with the, the site in the River Edge is in terms of the purpose of these historical sites and interpretation. Um, I, I put in Emma Willard because Elizabeth was very much disheartened by the fact that she could not go to college. She was in a family of girls. There was one boy, the storied beloved son of the father who goes off to Harvard and dies. And Elizabeth spends her growing up trying to become the boy that her father would approve of and it never happened. And it really came to a painful crunch for her and she was 
are indisputably quite brilliant when she couldn't go to college like the boys in the town. So Emma Willard is the first, as you can see in the sign, she's a really important person in terms of the history of education for women in this country because she said girls should have the same curriculum that boys have. And she petitioned the state of New York and they would not fund her ideas, uh, of Vermont, they would not fund her ideas. So she comes to New York, raises the money and starts the Troy Female Seminary. Elizabeth goes there. She's not terribly happy because she wants to be with the, in the regular uh, curriculum, but she's a good student. She graduates in 19... 33. And this is, a, a, you really, it's rare, it's very rare. You can find many statues, heroic statues uh, like this one uh, of, of um, men. And the interesting thing about this is it was alumni of Emma Willard School who formed a association in 1890, which is sort of an interesting time, uh, in 1890, which is again the beginning where we begin to see large numbers of women graduating from college and becoming doctors and lawyers. So this is sort of a moment where there's an opening up. And it was a graduate of her school who formed an association and raised the money and had this monumental statue. It's based on an oil painting made of, uh, of, of women, uh, Emma Willard and it sits on the, the campus of Rus Russell Sage College. And it was interesting having made the trip to Troy. And actually this trip I made in 2008 where my partner and I drove 880 miles in three days uh, to do research. I was doing research for the book that um, Deborah talked about and this was one of the places that we went. This also, if we fast forward to the suffrage movement, um, one of the things that some of you may know about is that uh, Suffragists in Pennsylvania had a replica of the justice bell made without the crack and added the word justice to the bell because the bell originally just said liberty, but she said, wait a minute, justice needed to be added. And this huge replica was itinerated around the state of Pennsylvania in 1915 for a state referendum. And it was uh, the foundry in Troy is where that, there's actually a picture in my latest book of the foundry of that bell being cast. So Troy, who would have thought Troy has uh, got interesting connections to women's history. Now we're going to Peterborough, New York, which is a hard place to find. It's sort of in the middle of New York State below the uh, 20 goes across New York through the Finger Lake and Pe Peterburg is, Peterborough is, down. We've gone a couple of times uh, once I uh, to visit. It's a wonderful place to go to if we ever get back to going to places. Garrett Smith is Elizabeth's cousin and he, he is a leading, a major, this is not hyperbole, what's written about Garrett Smith is not hyperbole in terms of, he was, in terms of his role as an abolitionist and a philanthropist and a, a reformer. He's 18 years older than Elizabeth Elizabeth's parents are very conservative, very difficult to deal with. They believe in hell and fire brimstone God, which prompts Elizabeth early in her life to have a kind of a mental breakdown uh, over issues of being terrified about this scary God. So Garrett Smith and his family uh, provide, she's, and the, uh, the other marker to um, Elizabeth Smith Miller, and then let me put up this marker. This is an interesting thing that shows the changing times. This is actually the second wife of Garrett Smith, and she was nom commonly known as Nancy. And one of the things that I've always noticed that several times I've gone to Peterborough is that Nancy doesn't get mentioned. So I was delighted in doing research for this talk to discover that, in fact, there is a marker to Anne Carol Fitzhugh's uh, Smith and, but it's in Hyattsville, Maryland. It's a group in Maryland that has uh, honored her. So I think I'll have to contact my friends in Peterborough and say, hey, there's a monument to Anne because she was very much part of when Elizabeth would spend long, many, many weeks, she'd spend summers there. And after she graduates from Emma Willard in, in 19, 1833, she starts spending lots of time at Peterborough. And it's where, um, 
uh, Garrett uh, introduces her and a group of girls to Harriet Powell, who is a young girl who is escaping from slavery. She, her slave owner was staying at a, at a ho hotel in Syracuse and she escaped and she was being secreted in Garrett and Nancy Smith's house while Elizabeth was there. So Garrett took this Elizabeth and this group of girls up and they spent several hours hearing Harriet Powell's terrible story of slavery. Um, later that night, she was costumed and put in a carriage and driven on the way to go to Canada. And shortly after she left, the slave owner showed up and banged on Garrett Smith's door. And he, of course, said, no, you know, never saw her, don't heard about her. He was very congenial. He invited the slave owner in for dinner. The slave owner was so charmed. He came in and had dinner. And after Garrett Smith knew that Harriet Powell was safe in Canada, he wrote a letter that was published in a newspaper to the slave owner telling him exactly what had happened. So this is important to understand Elizabeth, that she was in this kind of milieu. Uh, reformers, philanthropists, all the great issues of the day, you know, prison reform, peace, um, women's rights, abolition, all of these great reforms were, were being discussed with great energy. And one of the things that Elizabeth later talked about is she always noticed that Garrett remained calm. And that, that's sort of interesting because oftentimes Elizabeth managed to remain calm, but that sh this was a formative experience and I thought really, really important to show you. It was one of the places where we went just to sort of just have a sense of this. And this Garrett Smith is on actually mounted on one of my favorite um, mounting things for a plaque. It's mounted on a beautiful great big boulder, a huge great big boulder. It, it didn't work in terms of the PowerPoint, but I'm particularly fond of, of seeing um, Mar uh, plaques mar uh, mounted in that kind of way. I mean, again, a lot of this is also just an aesthetic uh, in, in this experience. There are lots of ways of approaching these monuments. Um, Elizabeth, and also in, at, uh, at Peterborough, Elizabeth met Henry, her husband, and she gets married. Um, they go off, the story that's often been told, He's a delegate to the World Anti-Slavery Society in London. That's where they go on their honeymoon. Um, that's the convention where Elizabeth, where Lucretia Mott, legendary Quaker reformer, who, who is um, one of my uh, favorite, favorite, really the touchstone people. Um, they, she's with a delegate of women who have come to be seated at this convention, but the men vote and say no women cannot be part of this huge international conference on slavery. And that's a, a, a huge part of Elizabeth's consciousness raising. First of all, to meet somebody like Lucretia Mott, which she talks a lot about, the impact of meeting a woman who could think for herself, did think for herself, said you could think for yourself if you were a woman and question things and wonder about things. And there was about a 22 year age game, but very important, again, meeting. Um, this, this sign is interesting because this actually was put up, as you can see, in what, 1938. And it's interesting because it was the Department of Education. So that's, again, sort of an interesting thing to sort of think about what was going on at the Department of Education in New York State. Because the house at this time, at that time, is really abandoned. There's no national park there. It's just sort of an abandoned house. But somebody thought to put that sign. When you go to Seneca Falls, you'll see a lot of these kinds of plaques. They're very uh, text heavy. This one is about the house. That's the pictures of the house. And Elizabeth and Henry called it Grasmere after William Wordsworth's house in uh, England. And it describes how um, they had been uh, living in Boston, but then Henry apparently said he had health problems. It's probably more like he kind of wasn't making a go as a lawyer. Uh, Elizabeth's father gives them this house and it's uh, and Elizabeth is, can have it in her own name because a married woman's property act has just been passed and he gives her the money and he says okay it's yours and so she becomes her own contractor and they're all it's interesting to go to Seneca Falls 
uh, if you like this kind of historical landmark where you just sort of stand and you read and you read, it, it's a, again a different way. Um, so we go to, they move there in 1847. Elizabeth basically kind of goes nuts, she says herself. Um, she's got, you know, kids. <laughs> she doesn't have the culture and the stimulation of Boston. She doesn't have the servants that she could rely on. The roads get muddy in the spring and there's malaria in Seneca Falls and it's dusty and miserable. And she's really sinking under the weight of all of that when she gets an invitation to go to this house, the Hunt House in Waterloo, which is nearby, because Lucretia Mott is coming to do missionary, uh, ministry work, uh, peace activism, Native American activism, and visit her sister, Martha, Martha Coffinwright, who lives in nearby Auburn, and would Elizabeth like to come to tea? And she does. And again, this is a typical kind of memorialization. And as I said earlier, I, I, we, we're not, I'm not putting these up expecting anybody to read them, but just sort of to show the type of landmarks, the decisions that are being made about how to, to do this. Um, so they have tea, Elizabeth explodes, pours out her heart, and out of that experience, um, there are uh, five women there, um, Jane Hunt, uh, Marianne McClintock, um, Martha Coffin Wright, Lucretia Mott, and Elizabeth. They're all Quakers. She's not. They're all a little bit older. Jane Hunt herself had just given birth a couple weeks earlier. Um, and then a few, few days later, after they've made this decision that they are going to call a women's rights convention to discuss the religious, social, and civil situation of, limit, of women, a couple of days later, Elizabeth then goes to this house, the McClintock House where she sits at a round table that's now in the Smithsonian and writes with um, one of the McClintock daughters, the Declaration of Sentiments, the iconic document that becomes the basis for the Seneca Falls, the Women's Rights Convention um, that, will, that will meet. And I recently went to an exhibit in New York City, not recently, because it was before the pandemic, and there was a wonderful display of archival material. And one of the things that I read is this excerpt from a letter that Elizabeth wrote in 1897 to um, one of the McClintock da daughters. And I, I put this in because this really shows one of the things that's been so striking to me as I've been spending, devoting many years to writing about women and researching women is that, that women, Many, many, many women are historically reverent, reverent. They know their history, they care about their history. And this is a letter where Elizabeth is writing saying, will you sell the table on which the declaration uh, was written? Uh, and of course she did, and it's now in the Smithsonian. So the Women's Rights Convention is held. When you go there, there's of course the Wesleyan Chapel, which has now been closed in. There's the large museum. And there's also this water wall, which I'm enormously fond of. I think it's a particularly unique and wonderful um, um, <clears throat> landmark um, of water coming over the Declaration of Sentiment. And I happened to be, I think I had just finished speaking and I looked over and uh, I, I saw this family um, just really engaged in studying this. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a picture that I wanted to keep in my brain, but also just to capture that the importance of, 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 that a landmark can have that kind of connection with people. You'll also see the Elizabeth Cady Stanton Elementary School. One of the places to find name, landmarks to women are schools. And there's one in Seneca Falls. Um, a couple of weeks later, the, um, another meeting, a replica of this convention was held in Rochester. And I put the arrow there because I wanted to draw your attention to the fact, and this was really interesting because this was the first convention that was solely run by women. Elizabeth and Lucretia Mott protested. They did not think it was a good idea, but they were overruled and Abigail Bush took the chair and they did a stellar job 
And from that point on, women chaired all their conventions. But look underneath Elizabeth's name. You'll see Lucretia Mott signed it. She was there. But Daniel and Lucy Anthony and Mary Anthony. Mary Anthony is uh, Susan's sister. She's the first high school principal in Rochester. And Daniel and Lucy are Susan's parents. But where's Susan? Well, Susan at this point has just finished being a teacher in Kalajahari, uh, where we also went, but that's a, that's a Susan story. And she's totally involved in the temperance movement. And in my book, I actually devote a lot of time to, for this because it doesn't typically get talked about, but I think it's a really important story that Susan is totally convinced that temperance is the key issue. And when, and so, um, Oh, wait, we should have them introduced. So what happens is Susan begins to hear all these, this talk about this Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she's getting publicity, their newspaper articles, her, fa her father and mother and her sister are talking about her. So that Susan then arranges in May of 1851, she goes to Seneca Falls, that's Amelia Bloomer, who's a mutual friend of the two, and she asks Amelia to introduce them. So Susan and Amelia hang out on a street corner, waiting for Elizabeth to return home after going to an abolition meeting, and they get introduced, and they, the way they talk about it, it's sort of love at first sight, the connection between the two. It starts off with Susan recruiting Elizabeth into the temperance movement. Susan, who's a brilliant organizer, has started a woman's temperance uh, organization in New York State. Uh, Elizabeth agrees to be the president. Susan's not so good at the upfront talking. And so Elizabeth does, although she writes to Susan and she warns her that she is going to undoubtedly offend people. And in her first speech, she does. She calls for divorce and other radical, scary things. And at the next meeting, the men and their female allies take over and actually pass a resolution saying that no women's rights topics can be discussed and that the men will be in charge. And then Susan has the epiphany that there is actually a cause deeper than this existential cause, deeper than temperance, and that's all the various and sundry issues affecting women from, uh, you know, from, mer from legal rights to social to monetary, you know, she herself as a school teacher, she knew she was paid much less than men. And it was that, again, that shift. And again, I just think it's a really interesting thing to think about in terms of, you know, why do people come to causes? What cause do they come to? Um, now we're going to go, and this again is a new mark, well, 2014, to Fort Plain, New York. We're still in New York. And what happens is that Elizabeth and Susan then, in the 60s, um, uh, throughout the, they meet in 1851. Elizabeth is starting to have her, what will eventually be seven children, all of whom grow to adulthood, which is unusual at the time. And Susan, meanwhile, in the bitter, bitter cold winter of 1854, she itinerates all over New York State, again, agitating for women's rights. And they meet and they write and they, you know, have all of this. By the 1860s, and this is a really interesting time, this 1867, um, they're now a team where they're going around speaking. And they're speaking, as you notice, and this is important, on universal suffrage. And this is their belief that after the Civil War, there's going to be constitutional reform that enfranchises everyone. And, um, but that's not to be, because what happens is when the 14th Amendment is passed, which is the Citizenship Amendment, in the second part of the 14th Amendment, for the very first time in the American history, the word male gets introduced in the Constitution and it gets introduced three times. And each time the word male is used in the second section of the 14th Amendment, it's in relationship to citizens as men, as male, and voting rights. That's because when the 15th Amendment is passed, which is the amendment that says that 
voting cannot be denied on the basis of color, race, and previous condition of servitude. That's why that amendment only applied to African American men, which of course blew up the women's movement. Uh, this is the period at which Elizabeth, um, to the to the to the uh, the sadness of many of us who uh, uh, are feel strongly about her, spews really awful. Um, uh, anti-racist, anti-immigrant um, rhetoric over this fight over the 15th Amendment out of her anger and her betrayal that the Republican-controlled Congress, the, who, who had been supporters of women's rights, then said, no, we're just going to franchise. And, you know, and it was the, the belief that the, the, the men in Congress who were writing this legislation could easily see that they could woo, that they could get the, the vote of freed slaves, the male slaves, because there weren't that many, but the notion to them of enfranchising women all over the country was just beyond anything they could imagine doing because they couldn't control that or count on that they would, they would have the, the votes. Um, in 1867 is also the first time that both, um, abolitionists uh, and uh, women's rights advocates, the two different groups, come together and campaign in Kansas. It's the first time there's a campaign to amend a state constitution to get out the words that said that only white men can vote. So there's a big referendum, a big campaign. Elizabeth and Susan go off to Kansas. This is when Kansas is just totally undeveloped, you know, just um, just trails for roads and just, you know, huts to sleep in. Elizabeth talks about one night, um, she was, there were mice running all over her face. So she went out to sit in the carriage. But while she was sitting in the carriage, it was all this noise and there was all this rocking. And she looked out and she saw that the hogs were scratching their fleas on the wheels of the carriage. I mean, they described these incredible conditions, but with great energy and vigor, they were campaigning both referendum, both to get the word um, black and to get the word um, male out of the constitution failed. And it was the beginning of one of the things I write about in my book of campaign after campaign after campaign involving generations of women, thousands and thousands of women doing just incredible, unthinkable amounts of work, raising the funds, going to doing things that women didn't do, knocking on doors, you know, to, in order to try to change uh, state constitutions. And at the same time, Elizabeth and Susan are also agitating Congress to change um, the federal constitution because a, 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 an amendment to the federal constitution is actually first introduced in the 1800s as the 16th amendment. Um, at the same time, 1867, that spring, Elizabeth buys some property in Tenafly, New Jersey. And it's wonderful on the map to notice that it very clearly just says Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, uh, a year later, um, she will start building her house, uh, it, which is where she'll live. And I'll show you a landmark a little bit later. So we're here in 1867, Elizabeth's building the house in 1868. She's living in Tenafly across the river, of course, is New York City. One of the reasons she picked Tenafly is access to the city through the train uh, to get to the go then across the Hudson River. Uh, and this marker in downtown New York near Park Place down by City Hall notes the corner the, that's named for them where they had their Women's Bureau, which was where they published their incendiary uh, but important uh, newspaper, The Revolution, and where they formed in 1869 the Women's Woman Suffrage Association. So this is a key thing. The building is still there. Uh, and New York is just full of Elizabeth places, Copper, Cooper Union, you know, the Church of the Puritan. I mean, there are just so many places because Elizabeth now has moved there um, in 1862. It's first in Brooklyn and then there are several other places she moves. This was one of the most interesting things I discovered. I discovered this several months ago. And the reason it's particularly interesting is that for my first two years of college education, I went to Western College for Women in Oxford, Ohio, which is now 
um, Western, it's now the college is part of Miami University, which is across the street. Western College for Women is also where Freedom Summer um, volunteers trained before they went to Mississippi, including the three men who were murdered. But this house, if you walk to this house, in front of it, you will find a marker that's vertical. There's a side A and a side B. <clears throat> and this first side describes the house and that it's the home of two of the university presidents, one of whom is Robert L. Stanton. Well, it turns out, and I did not know this when I wrote my book, that Robert L. Stanton is the brother-in-law of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And is that not cool? Side two is a place where I spent two years of my life not even knowing that Elizabeth had been there on November 9, 1870 uh, to give her favorite talk, um, which was Our Girls, which was her, her favorite talk. And this actually is a wonderful marker. And again, you can see it's the League of Women Voters, uh, also other sources that have given money <clears throat> to, to dedicate this. And so this was a really fun thing. And one of the things that I love about what I do is that I'm always, I've never, every book I do, I'm always still learning more and more, which is really fun. And this is one of my big finds. Um, these two, uh, again, you, Nobody can read them, but I just put them up because it's not uncommon. One is in Palo Alto, one is in Berlin, Wisconsin, and they're talking about women and their involvement. Sarah Wallace in the suffrage movement and Lucy Smith in the um, um, club movement, which then be becomes an important part of the fight for the vote. Um, and you'll, when you get all the way down, you'll read that it'll say that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony stayed with them. And that's not uncommon. And this is a scope because what's happened is in 1871, Elizabeth and Susan, you know, the railroad is completed, uh, transcontinental railroad. So they're traveling all over. In part, they're traveling all over. Here's a poster of Elizabeth's um, uh, speech in Massillon, Ohio. Uh, again, her lecture for our girls, uh, which she gave. But they're, they're, they're traveling in the 70s, and Elizabeth is so proud of herself because she's um, speaking and earning money, and she's supporting her lifestyle in the Tenafly house. Henry is basically in New York City doing lawyering. He sometimes comes for weekend, but Elizabeth is supporting herself and her family and and this house. And here, there have been a couple markers. I, when I first moved here, and this house is very close to where I live. And I, when I was writing my book, I would pretty much walk up the hill just to pay my respects. Uh, this is a new marker. Um, I actually had worked with Kevin, Deborah, um, uh, uh, in terms of writing uh, uh, another version of this poster, I guess. Uh, but this is, again, and why I put this in this place of my talk is that now we're in the, in the 1880s, and Elizabeth and Susan have both retired from the speaking tour, where they were both earning money, Elizabeth and Susan also. And now they've settled in, and they start this monumental project of writing the history of women's suffrage. 8,000 pages. It's incredible. Three volumes, small print a beautiful steel engraved painting uh, of portraits of some of the leaders. And that gets captured on this, on this sign, this history of women's mm -hmm. suffrage. Um, and they team up with Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who lives in Fayetteville, New York. And Matilda jo jo Jocelyn Gage is not as well known as Elizabeth and Susan, in part because she kind of splits apart um, at one point in about the 1880s and 90s, she doesn't think Elizabeth and uh, Susan are radical enough, um, but, but she's, a, you know, another important figure. And she's also the mother-in-law of Frank Baum, who, as you know, wrote Somewhere Over the Ra Rainbow. And there are some scholars who think that it was Matilda Jocelyn Gage's uh, influence on her son-in-law that made him write such a strong female hero. Um, and there are people who, and they were close, Frank Baum, and he, they actually lived with her uh, for a while, and they were close, so it's, uh, it's not an impossible notion um, of that. Um, both um, 
uh, Elizabeth, this is again a, my, a measure of the times that there are now landmarks being put up to, um, to honor Native American culture and Native American ex experiences. And in this uh, part of New, York, of New York, the upper state park, of course, of, the, of New York State, is the Iroquois Confederacy, the six tribes of the Iroquois Con Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee. And it is very much believed, based on the writings of Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Matilda Johnson Gage, who was very involved, that some of their ideas and their consciousness was very much part of because they, they were familiar with the, the power and the rights that the Native women had, um, the matrilineal line, and that they were very much influenced by, by this, particularly Matilda Johnson Gage, but also Elizabeth in her writings and Lucretia Mott. And so this is again an important sign of the times is that we're now finding a far greater diversity in landmarks. Um, so here we come, we're in the 1880s, and this is the uh, marker that has been placed at the site of a hotel, which was the Charlie Brown's restaurant where one of my sons worked when he was in college. Um, and many times I went there for dinner and I had no idea that I was trotting the space where Elizabeth had tried to vote. Uh, and this marker uh, talks about this story. And I wanted to show you this newspaper article. One, one of the things that's really fun for me to do is to do a lot of search of historical newspapers. And I do a lot of that in my latest book, The Vote, because I, I, it's part of my needing to show myself that women, although in my lifetime, have been invisible as historic actors, that wasn't true at the time. Many of these women were household names, like. Dorothea Dix, the great reformer. And this is a wonderful article. This actually, um, the New York Herald, the New York Herald um, sent a reporter over, and it's a really funny thing. He describes, um, is, again, if you want a copy of this, I can send this to you about, you know, and Elizabeth tells the whole story. You can see her silver hair, that her silver curls, tossing her silver, silver hairs that might have once been blonde and her merry blue eyes. And this st story gets picked up in the Chicago Tribune. There are also versions of this story get picked up in a Memphis newspaper, a New Orleans newspaper. Again, it may have been invisible for most of all of our education, but at the time, the, the, there were conversations, there was visibility, there was publicity. After Elizabeth votes, so that's 1880, Four years later, they both go to Johnstown, where Elizabeth's family still lives. And Susan lives in this boarding house. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth, and this is the marker, Elizabeth uh, lives with her family. And this is Mrs. Henry's boarding house, which was really neat that we actually got into it and walked around. And this is where they finished uh, working on volume three of their monumental history of woman's suffrage. This, I think, is a wonderful text. I, I very much like this text. It's really easy to read. Um, it answers the question of where was Elizabeth. So I, I thought, and I like the pairing of their names. So this is, I wanted just to show you that because that was cool. If we go to Washington, D.C., uh, Gallery 33, which is my favorite, you walk down the front hall of the portrait gallery and you'll first see uh, Frederick Douglass and then you turn into the gallery and you'll see this bust of Susan B. Anthony and that painting of Elizabeth. And it's by the famous um, artist. This is Elizabeth is, gone, is in Europe in 1882 visiting her daughter and son who lived there. And Anna Promke, who's a, a no, very notable uh, uh, artist, offers to paint her. And Elizabeth was very, very proud of this painting. And it's again, uh, shows her in all her majesty. Uh, if you go, go to the uh, Belmont Hall, Women's Equality National Monument, you'll see this bust by Adelaide uh, Johnson, who actually went to Europe and got the Carrera marble to do this bust. And this was actually exhibited at the 1893 um, 
in Columbia an exhib exhibition. Um, you go to the Capitol Rotunda. This is also by Adelaide Johnson, and that's uh, Susan Elizabeth and Lucretia Mott. And this was dedicated with great fanfare. Um, and uh, Carl, uh, you know, um, poems were written by this. It's a big celebration. And in 1921, and then shortly afterwards, it was taken out and put in the basement where it languished basically down in what was called the crypt. And it wasn't until 1997, uh, through the heroic efforts and massive fundraising uh, to get this move to a place of honor uh, in the Capitol. And this is uh, the steel engraving that was in one of the volumes of the history of women's suffrage. And I put this because this portrait is what you'll see if you go visit Frederick Douglass's home in Anacostia near Washington, DC. And I actually had gone there when I was writing my book about Madam C.J. Walker, uh, because I had read that Madam C.J. Walker had donated the final funds, I think $3,000 to save Frederick Douglass's home and that there was a plaque. So I got in my car, I drove to go look for the plaque, but discovered that the plaque had been removed and was in storage. But while I was there, I took a tour and was delighted because of course I knew about the, the argument the, the, between Frederick Douglass and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the tense, tense confrontation over the 15th Amendment. And so I sort of wondered what, because they had been very close and dear friends. And I sort of wondered, and then I walked into the house that had been replicated exactly how it was when Frederick Douglass died. And there was that portrait of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to talk about the period in Elizabeth's life when she spewed um, the anti-immigrant and racist rhetoric. And also she spewed rhetoric against women who did not support um, her views. I mean, she, she had a, 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 a way with words that, some, that sometimes has not left her reputation um, totally intact, but again, few of us would have that. And I, I think it's important to point out that in the uh, 1867, convention uh, where Sir Jonah Truth um, um, came and was a main speaker, that she stayed at Elizabeth's house. Frederick Douglass stayed at Elizabeth Cady Stanton's house. So all these things with all historical figures, with all of us, are, are just very complicated when we try to put all the pieces, pieces together. And, and I think what's clear to me in all my years of being immersed in American history, particularly American history that is not typically told, is that the legacy of, of racism and white supremacy uh, has been a through line throughout, throughout American history. Sir John Truth talked about that. She talked about that in, in 1867 in her speech. She talked about, yes, she told the audience that yes, you know, you've stopped slavery, but the roots, she used that word, the roots are so deep that it won't end until they're pulled out of the soil by the roots. And that was Sojourner Truth in 1867. Elizabeth in 1891 moves to New York City, and this is right at the corner. If you're on Broadway on 95th Street, you just hang up and you'll see the Stanton. Uh, and this, and there's the plaque. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, uh, founder and leader of the American Women's Rights Movement. Uh, and what happened with this, this building, it's not the original building, but it's the building, it's the site of the building that Elizabeth moved in with her son, Robert, and her daughter, Margaret. Margaret, who had actually graduated and taught uh, at Teachers College. Uh, and it's where she lived um, her last years and where she died. Um, if you go, you can ask the concierge, they'll let you in. There's a wonderful display in the lobby. Um, here's Elizabeth. She dies in October 2000, uh, in 1902. And just look at this. I, I just such an array of her obituaries. I particularly like the end of the noble life. Um, th this, is, this is how she gets memorialized in sketches and a photograph. Uh, around the country, in newspapers around the country and around the world. 
um, again, she was a household name in the course of her life. She's not <laughs> ended up having the household nameness. I just made up that word of like a Susan B. Anthony in part because um, she became her in her later years with her writing the woman's Bible and her, you know, continual um, taking on, you know, more radical ideas. Uh, she ended up getting censored by the organization where she had been president for the Bible that, that her rewrite of the Bible. Um, but never, but nevertheless, uh, at her death, um, she's uh, revered. Um, her marker in uh, Woodlawn Cemetery, you notice that she has mother, author, orator. It's all listed with all her things. So what happened? Well, her daughter Harriet Stanton Blanche, one of her two daughters, returned, had returned. This, she'd lived in uh, England, had been married, had two children. One died uh, at a very young age. But then she and her husband returned to America in 1902. And Harriet picks up the torch. And she founds um, several uh, women's organizations. She becomes a really important organizer and recruiter. Uh, and this is a memorial that was just dedicated to Harriet. And Elizabeth's uh, image and name, uh, one of the really favorite people I wrote about, Maud Malone, little known suffragist in New York City, but really important suffragist, um, founded this organization, Harlem Equal Rights. Um, she was the first one to do open air meetings in New York, the first parade in New York. She's a really important, very totally committed to uh, diversity. She was a librarian, um, but she had this pin name. She was actually arrested for heckling politicians. She was a she was a pro. She would go to these meetings full of men and you know, politicians, including like Wilson would be speaking, running for president, and she'd say, where are the women or what are you going to do for women's suffrage? And she'd get manhandled, she'd get dragged out by the police, she'd get put in jail, she'd be tried. Newspapers were full of headlines about Maud Malone arrested again, Maud Malone arrested again. But she was indomitable and just was determined. She was actually the first one uh, to go to jail. Um, but she wore this pin to one of her trials, and that's our Elizabeth. So what? here we are with the 19th Amendment. Um, this is a series of markers. This is a front and the back of the Constitution and the 19th Amendment. And I really want to point out that although I'm finding people who will say that the 19th Amendment didn't enfranchise this group of women or that group of women. The thing about the 19th Amendment is all it says is that there cannot be discrimination on the basis of, cannot be denied on the basis of sex. And the heart of this issue was the framers decision to give the states the power to set voter qualifications. That's the heart of the issue is that the states are the ones empowered by the United States Constitution to decide. So all the Constitution does, like with the 15th Amendment or like the uh, 12th Amendment that changed out their elections with the, or the age, I guess it's the 25th, 24th, is that is what they can't do. But as you can see, there's a lot of, as we see with what's going on now, uh, there's a lot of latitude at why, how um, uh, states can deny people the right to vote. Uh, finally, uh, the statue to the left is the proposed statue in, um, that's going to be erected in 2021 in Johnstown. The one to the right is going to be erected, dedicated, unveiled on August 26th in New York City on Liberty Walk, thanks to the heroic efforts of a group of monumental women and their monumental organization that have raised the funds. Uh, so Joner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the first statue of historic women uh, to be in uh, Central Park. Uh, the ship is a ship named after Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That's the USS um, Elizabeth C. Stanton. Many ships during World War II were named after women, liberty ships. And you know, you might wonder why 
during World War II was the Navy naming ships after historic women. It's kind of a provocative thought, but we're out of time. So I'll leave you with that provocative thought about the, the, uh, the, the waves of, of, women's, of women's history. Uh, and end with an invitation. Uh, that's my contact information. The bottom one is, a, is an Instagram uh, uh, account with monuments. Uh, and feel free to um, send me questions, um, comments. I'm delighted to talk. Let me know about landmarks. Um, talk about all of these ideas. And thank you very, very much. And stay safe and stay well. And if you have a bell, ring it 19 times on the 26th or two days after. Just ring it. We have our bell. So thank you. So back to you, Deborah. Okay. Um, did you quit out of the, okay, there you go. Well, that was really great. Very good. <laughs> I, I very much enjoyed that. Well, what an interesting perspective to go around and look at markers for her. Um, uh, that was great. Um, I guess we have the questions and the chat room. You can see them, Penny? Uh, let me put on chat. Um, I clicked on chat, but I'm not seeing anything. Do you want to just tell me what you're seeing? It might be toward the bottom if you scroll down that window on the right where yeah, participants I, is. No, I, I see chat. I, it's just that, uh, not, that okay. I'm not seeing, I mean, I... I okay. Um, let's see. I'm starting at the top. Um, somebody was having... Um, a little trouble seeing. Congratulations, President Carroll. Um, will this presentation be posted on the BCHS website? Penny did um, say that it was okay that we record this. So um, the intentions are to load it to the video section of the Bergen County History.org website. So uh, it might take me a little bit to get it there though. Um, Another comment uh, or question uh, from Jan Jane. Katie Stanton was a woman of means, as there were many of her peer, as many of her peers in the women's rights movement. Did women in the working class and below have a voice in the suffrage movement? Um, of course, excellent question, and the answer is yes. What what happens is that it, in in the beginning of the movement, it, you know, in the early eighteen hundreds. Working women are primarily focused on, have not yet, the connection is not, and again, I write about this in my book, The Vote, have not yet made the connection between having the vote and the vote being able to impact and affect their working conditions. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing. There is at the Seneca Falls Convention and at the Rochester Convention and all the subsequent conventions, because there are many conventions that then spread across the country after this first one, there is always a resolution dealing with working opportunities, with wages, and with working women. Lucretia Mott in 1848 makes a, 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 a really powerful statement about remembering working women. So the, 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 the consciousness of working women and wage inequality and lack of opportunity is there throughout in the res resolutions. But in terms of organi organizational connection, that comes more around the 1890s. A woman named um, Mary uh, Sullivan uh, Kinney, o Kinney um, becomes very important. She's at Hull House and she's um, a, a unionist, a trade organizer and um, a, a worker. And that's the point at which that connection gets made. And Mary Kinney then and Rose Schneiderman, again, I write about these really powerful, important working leaders, do come 
to conventions and they do talk and they do lobby and that whole nexus of, oh, if we have the vote, then we, we then can affect legislation that affects our working conditions, which is why big business then becomes one of the big op 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 opponents of the enfranchisement of women because they see, oh my God, if we enfranchise all these working women, they are going to have power in terms of, in terms of legislation that gets passed. So, um, and, and there were, there's a, a woman named, um, oh, what was her first name? Woodward, Charlotte Woodward. Charlotte Woodward, um, who was at the Seneca Falls Convention and she was a glove maker. And she actually lived, um, I, again, uh, there, you can Google her and learn about her. But she and a group of working women were at the Seneca Falls Convention. They were active with all their life. And she lives to see um, the passage of the 19th Amendment. She's too ill to go vote on uh, the first time she's able to vote. But she's alive and she talks about it and she remembers it. And so it's sort of a general overall converse comment I, I want to make in terms of the the, the suffrage movement. One of the things that I'm, I'm seeing is um, that people are making some, um, you know, over generalizations, um, like the whole movement was racist, or the whole movement was this, or the whole movement was that. And I think with any movement, um, it's, it behooves us to, to kind of, you know, go, we've heard, you know, the feminist movement of the 1960s was this and that. And yet some of us who lived through it said, wait a minute, that wasn't my experience. So I appreciate the question. And I very much had an eye out for that um, and was sort of looking for that and looking for the emergence of that. Uh, there's a wonderful woman named Sarah Bagley. Sarah Bagley was a leader of one of the low strikes in textile. She's, she's a really, she's kind of has a flash of importance in history and then she disappears. But in 1915, suffragists in Massachusetts during that huge campaign remembered her and they actually made um, a fundraising out of a, of a thread holder, a thread holder that they called the Sarah Bagley thread holder so that they were remembering and honoring this working woman in 1915. So it's as with everything, it's, it's, it, they're just, there's so much complexity. Okay. Uh, that's great. Um, so from Patricia, we have wonderful talk. Thank you so much. From Karen, we have fantastic review and analysis of Stanton through a virtual tour of historic sites and markers. Thank you, Penny, for a most wonderful, enjoyable, illuminating talk. Thank you. Uh, from Lee, we have thanks for a terrific talk once again, Penny. Then from uh, Olivia, we have any places or markers that really surprised you in your research? Well, the Oxford, Ohio one, <laughs> with the one about Elizabeth Cady Stanton speaking on November 9th, 1870, that, 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 this certainly was a big surprise. I haven't seen it. I mean, some of these are on my to, to visit list. Uh, there's another one I haven't seen too that has me sort of a little bit raising an eyebrow. There's one that's been erected recently, I guess, uh, 2019. I think I lost you. Do you hear me? No, we hear you. Oh, okay. I got, okay. Um, I, uh, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it's a, it's a statue that has um, Sir Jonah Truth, Elizabeth Cady Stanton with Harriet, young Harriet at her feet, and they're on a pedestal, and then there's a tall spiral, and at the top, they've put, um, the sculptor has put uh, Alice Paul and Ida B. Wells. And I, I, I just, I'm really curious, um, um, the story, if anybody's going to know anything about the suffrage movement, they'll probably know about, they'll, they'll, and I've had people tell me, they'll come up and they'll say, you know, it was all racist because Alice Paul wouldn't let Ida B. Wells march. Um, people will come and tell me that and I'll say, but that's not the whole story. The whole story is, because there was a Chicago Tribune reporter who was there and was uh, monitoring the whole and wrote at length about it, as did Ida B. Wells. Uh, that in in fact um, that 
what when when the decision finally was made and it was back and forth and back and forth she and two friends bell squire and virginia brooks who were white women who she organized with in chicago made a plan that ida b wells would wear the all the regalia of the illinois a delegation you know had and a stroll and all that and she would be in a crowd and when the the, the delegation walked by she then uh, would slip in and also it overlooks the fact that there were 22 uh, newly formed members uh, or the founders of the uh, delta sigma theta the Af african-american um, sorority at howard university who marched with Mary Church Terrell, and there were African American women who marched with the DC. So it's it's so important to me that that we get beyond just the well, duh, you know, it was all this, it was all that, and to just really interrogate sort of those ideas and those things. Because when we just stop and we say it was all this, all racist or all elitist or all that, then. Um. That's where we were meant to begin. And knowing the that there was a lot, there were moments white of, women are pouring of out. solidarity of eight, and it also that there was agency. Yes, that African American women were not passive victims; they were agencies in their own uh, liberation, forming clubs, marching, protesting. So it's really important, I think, to 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 have that. But I'm beginning to preach now, so I'll. <laughs> Um, Kelly wrote, that was so informative. Thank you so much. Um, Lee wrote, what is Penny working on next? <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, um, what is Penny working on next? I, I think what I'm working on is, is a, probably the project is to somehow organize and put together 30 years worth of all of this research I've been doing. I have photographs everywhere. I have notes, I have trips, just to keep track of all the trips. Last year, actually a year ago, and you can go to my blog. Uh, a year ago, my partner was uh, attending a conference in Glasgow of international researchers in intellectual disabilities. And we found out it was really expensive to fly to Glasgow. Well, 2018 was the centennial of partial suffrage of women in Great Britain. And I knew, because I really followed the British story, because the British story is really connected with the American story. And so I knew that a lot of statues and memorials had been erected. So I designed, what was it, three, Linda's actually here, three week, uh, three week trip. We went, we went to London and then we, I marked all these places. We drove all the way over to the West Coast, up the West Coast, um, to Glasgow, across, down, middle. We did all of this um, in the footsteps of suffragettes. And it's all on my blog. I think there are 14 posts where you can read and lots of pictures. So, but it's somehow putting all of that together. All, all the, our 2008, a 1995 trip where we drove across the country. So Lee, I know that you've got great research skills. So anytime you'd like to come and help me organize. <laughs> in your mask because <laughs> it's that's what I'm trying to sort through before I die <laughs> so um, let's see Dolores wrote enjoyed this tremendously Emily wrote do we know about Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth staying with uh, Elizabeth from correspondence and uh, was that at her home in Tenafly oh not at her home in Tenafly Tenafly. It, um, Sojourner Truth stayed with her in at the 1860 convention, and she would have been in New York City. And uh, that's well documented by newspaper articles, um, by Sojourner Truth herself. Um, Frederick Douglass himself has talked about that Elizabeth Cady Stanton gave him a place to lay his woolly head, I think is, his, is the quote. So the documentation for those and Elizabeth uh, it writes a letter when Sir Jonah Truth stays with her to the um, world that's published where she writes about that all of them are in awe of Sir Jonah's truth wisdom, but the problem is she smokes. So, and Elizabeth was a non-smoker. So, um, 
so we do, so the, those are, there is documentation for those claims. It's not a lot. They, I mean, it's not like they were hanging out or spending a lot of time, but, and I'm not sure that Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony ever sort of reconciled in the same way that Elizabeth and Frederick, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Doug, Douglass, Douglass did um, later in life. Although, um, Frederick Douglass does have the steel engraving of Susan B. Anthony on the second floor of his house. So that uh, is also there. Did that answer the question, I think? Yeah. Um, let's see, we have from Kelly, when and where was the initiation for the 19th Amendment? The initiation? Yeah, that's what was written. In, in the well, the language, the language that, that first gets introduced in Congress by a senator from California, Aaron Sargent, and it is exactly the same language. And at the time, it's the 13th Amendment. And it is exactly, uh, the 16th Amendment, excuse me. And it is exactly the same language that then is what is ratified in the 19th Amendment except, of course, three other, you know, amendments, the direct election of, 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 of senators, uh, income tax and prohibition have been added before the 19th Amendment. And you'll hear oftentimes it's claimed that Susan B. Anthony wrote the language of the 19th Amendment. It's called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, which I actually didn't do in my book. Um, Susan B. Anthony you know, there's no indication that she did that. Elizabeth was the one that was the legal scholar and, you know, had all of that. A another really interesting thing with the article that I showed you about uh, Elizabeth's voting in 1880, it's really interesting in reading the whole article because Elizabeth absolutely is crystal clear about the mechanics of the disenfranchisement of women. She actually talks and says about that women were enfranchised women who owned a certain amount of property, and of course they would have been unmarried women, had the right to vote in New Jersey in 1776. New Jersey was the only state, and that lasted until 1807. And then she actually talks about the fact that the legislators passed a bill, which was illegal. They passed bills to disenfranchise women, and it wasn't until I think 1844 that they changed the constitution. So Elizabeth knew all of this. She knew the legal stuff. She knew that kind of technicality. Um, I mean, she's a really important person to think about. She established the notion of women as a class. I mean, she's really interesting in terms of, which has implications for all of us with the legislation that then uh, lawyers and justices like um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg then carried forth these ideas. And we have uh, Captain John Outwater, uh, a Revolutionary War veteran who went on to uh, be in the, I believe it's a, a senator, um, uh, um, was positive about supporting women continuing to be able to vote uh, at that time. Uh, what, what was the year? Uh, eight, um, 1807. That they, yeah. 1770 six to 1807. And you know, that's another thing to think about. Um, South, South Dakota, it took seven tries, seven tries before the state men in South Dakota enfranchised women, seven referendums, seven campaigns, starting from 1890 to um, uh, 1918, that women kept at it. The state of Oregon, four, uh, six times. I mean, Michigan four times. I mean, it's really stunning when you think about the amount of effort and the opposition to overcome the opposition to enfranchising women. Imagine that. Imagine running a campaign from 1890. Um, at one point, Elizabeth ends up, um, uh, or, and she's speaking, and I think she's maybe back in South Dakota or someplace, and she, she'd spoken there like 25 years before. She asked so many people and they, you know, raised their hand. And, and there's another referendum in New York in uh, 1894. And Elizabeth's beside herself. She just talks about the humiliation 
of being controlled by um, an aristocracy of, of, of sex. And she talks about how they're testifying to legislators who are the grandsons of legislators that they had testified before when she first spoke to the New Jersey, uh, to the New York legislator in 1854. 1854, she addresses the New York legislature, and she's still addressing them in 1894. And she is so outraged and humiliated. Wow. So don't take it for granted. <laughs> Not that anybody here would. Well, we have just a few more um, here. Um, uh, let's see, what from Sandra, what can we learn from Stanton on women in leadership? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's, wow. I, I could ask Sandra that question, too. So, Sandra, send me an email and we can go back and forth. But what can we learn from Stanton? Uh, first of all, um, knowledge. First of all, know what you're talking about. Just be really, really, really well informed. That's, that's one of the things is to just, just be smart about what, whatever, whatever it is. The other is choose your friends carefully and your allies, you know, just, and, 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 and nurture them. I mean, she and Susan had some rough times, but they kept that bond because, and I, I did a lot of thinking about that is what, what was it that kept that bond? Because they were just disparate people. Susan, Elizabeth was forever doing things to, you know, make Susan crazy. Um, but it's because they were focused on the cause. So that's another theme that I see with many of the suffragists is they just transcended a lot of the petty stuff because they were focused, focused on the cause. So I think that's another thing about leadership is if you can be out enough of yourself and whatever it, it is that you have to personally deal with, you know, not be, what do they say, thin skinned or that was a problem that one of the leaders, Anna Howard Shaw, had is that she was very thin skinned. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's a, a, another thing about leadership. And another thing is fierceness. You just have to be fierce. And Elizabeth was fierce. Susan was fierce. They were not women that were going to be pushed around. Just fierceness. And I think that's why I put that in my title, The Fierce Fight. It's just fierceness. And some of these fierce women were very, um, very congenial looking. Uh, others of them weren't. So fierceness isn't necessarily uh, like um, like my uh, three-year-old grandson the other day who held a toy tiger and went growl. So it doesn't have to be that kind of fierceness. I'm a little bit fierce like that. I think people tell me I can be scary, which is probably true. Um, so you don't have to be scary and you don't have to growl, but you do have to be fierce. You always have to be fierce. It's a challenge sometimes navigating um, not being thought of as being a bitch. <laughs> but anyway. See, I, I think that word should be eradicated from the absolute dictionary because that's, again, one of those words to denigrate women. And I'm not a fan of embracing those words because it's empowering. I'm a fan of, and let's talk about misogyny. Let's talk about uh, you know, let's talk about all of these things, but I, I think to embrace those kinds of words and to keep them alive um, is, is, is not, is not, and not a way any of us should really look at ourselves because there's, there's nothing positive about that. It's really about being clear, being focused, and being fierce, right. and, and knowing, knowing what you're talking about, knowing, yep. you know, knowing. You have to know where you're going. Uh, I'll, I'll cross it out. Thank uh, you. <laughs> um, Anita wrote, Elizabeth died before the vote was won. How did she conclude the history of the movement that she wrote? Was she hopeful? Yeah. Anita, thank you. There are six volumes, um, and you actually can read them. Um, since we're in this pandemic, if anybody has time, you can read them at uh, Gutenberg. Just, just Google history of woman suffrage. Uh, Elizabeth Susan and Matilda Johnson Gage just wrote the first three volumes. Susan B. Anthony and a woman named Ida, uh, Harper, Husted, Ida H Harper Husted wrote the last three. I think I did them backwards. Ida Husted Harper, right. Um, 
uh, did the, the last three. So um, they, they ended it, um, she would have, they did publish the last volume, I think in 90, let me see, 91, maybe 97. So it really ends that when you read those first three volumes, what you're really gonna be reading about is really fascinating about their conventions, who talked, who was there. Um, of course, it's their perspective, their editing, their writing. Um, there are a lot of voices that aren't there, but, and there's a lot of criticism about the fact that there are not many African-American votes. But one of the really fascinating things I find when I read them is every single state uh, group of the National Women's Suffrage, they had conventions, they had state conventions and then they had the national convention. Every single convention of the state would report and they had an actual formula about what was going on in their state. And it really is heartrending to read, for example, consent, consent, the age at which girls are considered capable of consenting to sexual activity. And women are tracking that because early on in the women's movement, particularly Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia, uh, uh, Lucy Stone are very much tracking these consent laws because the age in many states is 10. And it's women who are fighting the fight to get the legislators to raise the consent age. So you can read this, you can read like in Delaware, like in Delaware, it's 10 and then they get it to 14 and somewhere else it's maybe 14, they maybe get it to 16, but every time, and all this is reported, they report on women's employment, they report on consent laws, they report on divorce, they report on marriage, all of this gets reported at this convention once a year. And one of the interesting things is, is every time the age of girls' consent uh, to sexual activity is raised, the penalty to men is lowered. Hmm. So, but th that's the, the, there's, there are things that can be gleaned out of the history of women's suffrage that a lot of people don't talk about because they criticize it for the absence of voices. But if you look at it for some of that information, it, it's really, a, it's interesting. And it also shows the broad scope, the broad scope. And these are women with no political power, but um, there, there, there's a woman named uh, Clarina, um, how, I mean, Nichols from Vermont who goes to Kansas and the Kansas legislature is meeting and she goes around the state and gets petitions signed to force the organizers of the, conve of the constitutional convention to let her attend. So she actually forces her way into having, in being able to sit in. So she takes her knitting and she sits day after day after day, listening to the men while she's doing her knitting and listening and listening. But because of her, in that first constitution in Kansas, women got the right to have custody of their own children. They got a sliver of voting rights. I think they could vote for school trustees. But when you just think of the rather heroic, tedious, tedious, tedious work that women did just to get a shred of, of, of a right, it, it's really, um, really awe-inspiring. Hmm. You fall on a tradition there. Um, let's see, Bill wrote, did women vote in different percentages for either party than men did? Oh, wow. Um, records weren't kept, um, records weren't kept with, with the first, with the first uh, election, the 1920 presidential election, um, th there was a lot of fear and talk about that, that women would just vote like men, that women would vote like a block. And it, it's turned out in terms of the analysis that that didn't happen. Women didn't just vote like men and they didn't just vote um, in a block. There was no women's voting block, which was one of the fears about that. And I think I've forgotten the date. Um, it's the, um, oh goodness, it'll come to me. Um, uh, the election where women, um, uh, it'll probably pop in after I sign off, uh, where actually it's documented that women are voting in larger numbers than men and they're voting democratic. And ever since then, um, that's been true is that women 
women, there more women register and more women vote and women are vote Democratic for the Democratic Party. But you can actually get those statistics on online. The what's it? The center. There's a center at Rutgers, an excellent center. If you that has all that documentation with graphs and charts. And if if you want, you can email me, and I can send you the link. But it's got huge implications for this upcoming election. And this is the next to last one. Aloha Eve wrote, as an independent researcher on these topics as well, don't you find it exasperating that there isn't a national center for information initiating action on important related matters? Um, no leadership for centennial celebration, though a commission was theoretically established. Anthony turned 200 this year, exclamation mark. Elizabeth, five years ago, come on, a parade. <laughs> Are there any resources that are your go-to? And thank you for a terrific talk, learn stuff. And surprise, when I had a pilgrimage to pay respects to Susan B. Anthony's resting place, Frederick, Frederick Douglass is nearby. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, go-to. That's really interesting question. Um, I'm pretty eclectic. Uh, um, and, no, I started doing this long ago, like I'm sure you did, when I actually physically drove. Uh, I remember driving to um, Indianapolis to do research on Madam C.J. Walker. Um, when we drove across the country and I was writing Girls' History, Growing Up Female in America, we stopped at the Charlotte Hall Museum that had an incredible repository of photographs. Because I do my own photo research for my books in um, Prescott, Arizona. Um, Dorothea Dix at Houghton Library in Harvard. So um, th those were, that was fun. Uh, that, that was an amazing. I, I, I remember the, them bringing the box of material of Dorothea Dix's um, papers and going through it and picking up, of course I had gloves on, a uh, letter that uh, Abraham Lincoln had written to her thanking her and then finding in an envelope a, a snippet of her brown hair that her lifelong companion Anne Heath had left or going to the Library of Congress when a totally snooty, and I love librarians, Lee, I'm not being nasty, but this librarian was particularly snooty um, guy who told me I absolutely could not see Elizabeth, Susan B. Anthony's original material. I could just look at facsimiles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then about 45 minutes later, he sheepishly had to appear with a cart full of boxes of the original material, Elizabeth, Susan B. Anthony's actual diaries, because Ken Burns had taken all the copies. <laughs> so uh, that's thrilling. And that doesn't happen anymore because so much of everything, uh, as much, because so much is uh, on the internet, so much has been digitized. So it's good in terms of that we're in a pandemic, but there, 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 there was a, a thrill. So I think in terms of my sources, I guess I'm just really eclectic. I just, and, and used to do not, not anymore, but just wander through a library, just uh, looking at books or going to museums, just, um, yeah, just pretty eclectic uh, research. Um, I guess I guess that's the best answer I can give you, but I'll think about it and if I find something, send me your email and I'll, I'll let you know and tell me what you use. Okay, <clears throat> and then Jane, um, this is the last one wrote to the Historical Society, great presentation and a great public service. Thank you so much. I look forward to more. So to that, I can say, um, if you want to, um, we post a lot of information on our Facebook page, but you can also sign up if you're not already to get our email blast. And that is a great way to keep in communication with people. Um, so um, on that note, I just um, thank you so much, Penny. You know, it was really wonderful you did this for us. Um, oh, you're very, very welcome. Thank, thank you very much. Everybody appreciates it. <laughs> yes. And, you know, sign up for, you know, you'll find lots on my blog and my website. There are videos. There are all kinds of things. And I'd love to be in conversation with everybody. And don't forget to get a bell for the 26th, 19 okay. times. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Sweet dreams. Thank you. Right. And thank you to all attendees for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.